Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Humanity is struggling to find a balance between the tremendous benefits of social media and their potential harms to society. One might shrug off these concerns as the inevitable side effects of any technology. But with some technologies, especially those that apply at scale and can impact billions of people in the blink of an eye, the costs of getting things wrong are significant. In this episode, I talked to Molly Crockett about morality, emotion, decision-making, and trust applied to social media platforms. What have we learned so far from the research in this arena? What answers do we have already? And what questions remain unanswered? And in the meantime, what guiding principles can lawmakers use in shaping regulation about the role of such platforms in society? Molly is a neuroscientist who studies human morality, altruism, and decision-making. She is a professor at Yale University, where she runs the Crockett Lab, which tries to understand the psychological and neural mechanisms of social decision-making and how we form impressions about things. Her approach integrates social psychology, behavioral economics, neuroscience, and philosophy. Molly, welcome to Brave New World. Delighted to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I, you know, I got to say, I love your name. You know, I, I feel that some names have more gravitas than others. And, you know, some of my colleagues kid me about it. But I think, you know, I would believe anything written by a Molly Crockett. <laughs> You're not the first person to say that, actually, but thank you. <laughs> so, um, so let's start with, you know, I've had some really interesting conversations on social media with uh, some of my previous guests, namely Sinan Aral and, and uh, Jonathan Haidt. And, you know, with Jonathan, I discussed, uh, you know, a bunch of things, including the impacts of, you know, social media on society, specifically on democracy and, and mental health of teens. You know, and he provided me his sort of perspective as a social psychologist. I'm just curious to get your take. You know, you're a neuroscientist who's, you know, closer to the brain, you know, than most people I know. And so I just, you know, want to kick this off with asking you, what do we know about you know, the brain function that can help us make informed predictions about, you know, how social media impacts human behavior and how it will impact behavior in the future if we just sort of let it, let it roll unfettered. Unfettered, that's a little frightening. But um, yeah, it's a great question and something I've thought about a lot over the past several years and, and have been doing increasingly more empirical studies on. Uh, I consider myself a, a social scientist or a behavioral scientist uh, by way of neuroscience, I think. I, I trained in neuroscience. I've always been really fascinated by the brain, but increasingly the work in my lab has turned towards understanding human behavior in the context of large-scale social networks online. And I think the neuroscience background gives a useful perspective in terms of a starting point. There's a lot we still don't know about the brain, but there are established principles of learning and decision making that can be seen not just in humans, but indeed in, in many species. And one of those principles is reinforcement learning, which you're probably familiar with uh, as someone who works in the artificial intelligence field. And that term reinforcement learning is, is sometimes used differently in different fields. Um, in my world, we think of reinforcement learning as the, the processes through which uh, the brain and, and, and behavior comes to uh, learn which actions are likely to lead to reinforcing rewarding outcomes. And we know a lot about how reinforcement learning works in the brain, which neurochemical systems it engages, um, the relationship between reinforcement learning and processes like addiction. And the starting point is that we know social media platforms draw on principles of reinforcement learning in the sense that a goal, you know, some might argue the primary goal of platforms is to keep users engaged and spending time on their products. And I think at least the caricature of the tech industry that has been painted by some critics 
is that these are little slot machines in our pockets, right? And I don't necessarily disagree with that characterization, but I don't think it's a complete characterization. There are important differences between addiction and reinforcement learning that are complicated. Um, and a behavior that's repeatedly reinforced, like logging into your Instagram or your Twitter or whatever, posting something, getting positive feedback from your friends, likes, retweets, whatever, that is going to increase your frequency of that behavior. It might become a habit. A habit is a behavior that is emitted without regard for the long-term consequences, but rather is a response to a stimulus that's emitted because in the past, uh, responding to that stimulus and in that particular way gets a reward, right? It is, is it addiction? You know, addiction has other criteria that I think most users of social media probably don't meet. And so there's a worry also that using those terms interchangeably might be misleading in some way. But the bottom line is that we do know that behavior on social media, when it's reinforced, becomes more frequent. There is a fantastic paper published uh, recently by Bjorn Lindstrom and colleagues showing in a very detailed and fine-grained way that if you look at how the frequency of posting on Instagram and a couple of other platforms relates to the amounts of rewards that people get over time, it follows a pattern that is really, really closely mimicking what is seen in, in hundreds of studies of reinforcement learning across many, many different species. So clearly there is a principle of reinforcement of behavior that's guiding our, our decisions to spend time online. So, you know, you, you do a lot of sort of controlled experiments and, you know, experiments on individuals and sort of controlled settings. How do we take that and extrapolate it to the real world, right? So, I mean, you mentioned reinforcement learning and, you know, I've been reading a really interesting book called The Alignment Problem by Brian Christian. And he has a, a whole chapter on reinforcement learning. And so, you know, I, it's, it's funny that, that you would start with that because, uh, you know, I've been reading about that and he goes and sort of, you know, goes back to Skinner and someone called Clough, who was a, a researcher at the right Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, who uh, sort of proposed that, you know, our neurons are hedonistic, you know, that they are pleasure seeking. So we are pleasure seeking, you know, by design, and that this mechanism of learning is guided by sort of expectations and, and sort of some sort of fulfillment of expectations, right? So when we, you know, crave something or, or we uh, get happy about something, it means that our previous model of the world has now changed and we expect something more. And if we get it, well, that's reinforced, you know, and if we don't, then it isn't. But, you know, there's a suggestion that, you know, we sort of crave these dopamine hits and, you know, just like cocaine, apparently, you know, you sort of have this expectation that the world will be great, right? So there's something new coming along. And unfortunately, when it doesn't, there's sort of a corresponding crash. So is that the kind of stuff that you conjecture is happening uh, a lot with younger people on social media? And how do you actually test something like that, you know, in sort of the wild? Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you can't do that, how do you sort of take what you're doing in sort of a controlled setting and extrapolate it to that? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, I do think that reinforcement learning can describe a lot of uh, our social media behavior, not just in young people, but in any user. And I mean, there's, there are actually separate, really interesting questions around how these processes might change across the lifespan because uh, we know that the prefrontal cortex, of course, is, is continuously developing uh, up through your early 20s and the, the dopamine system is showing um, tr changes throughout the lifespan. And, you know, in, in older adults, there are, are differences um, that, that might explain some of the differences in, in social media behavior that we can see. Um, it's very, very difficult to test this empirically as you, as you surmise. And what we do in my lab is a way of doing research that's, that's basically triangulating across these questions with different methods. So I think a really powerful approach that we really like to use is to take an idea, like a certain type of expression is explained 
by social reinforcement, let's say. And you can test that idea in real social media data. So Twitter is the most accessible platform for data. You can, as an academic, access loads and loads of data through their APIs and essentially look at the relationship between how much reinforcement, how many likes or retweets someone gets for a tweet at time one and how that affects their likelihood of tweeting in a similar way at time two. And you can look at these trajectories over time in massive data sets, um, you know, millions of tweets. And that is a really useful approach because it allows us to test hypotheses about patterns of behavior out in, in the wild. But of course, it's not experimental. So we can't make causal inferences with a, with a lot of confidence from that kind of data. But we can supplement those studies with lab experiments where we manipulate the different variables of interest. Like we could see if we turn up the amount of reward someone gets for making a particular type of expression or turn down that amount of reward, does that cause a change in their behavior? Because we're doing an experiment where we're randomly assigning people to get more or less positive feedback for particular types of expressions, if we see the same patterns in a simulated social media environment in the lab, and we can juxtapose that with our observational data from the social media studies, then that gets us further towards just being able to say something uh, more comprehensive about the psychological me mechanisms driving the behavior. So what, so what are we seeing? Are we seeing that we're sort of transforming into a new species because of this technology? Like what's happening, you know, at, at a large scale in society? That is, well, you know, what's, what's the nature of this transformation? How do you describe it? That's a great question. I don't know if I would say we're becoming a new species, but I don't know what the, I don't know what you would, what criteria you would have to satisfy to, to, um, to be a new, to be to a new species. That box. Um, and I mean, I think, I think you're, your question about long-term change is, is a really important one and, and very difficult to study. I mean, in, you know, social media has not been around for very long, right? You know, 15 years, give or take, depending on what, what you define it. So, you know, on the time scale of human evolutionary change, this is, this is a hot second, right? I mean, this is, this is barely any time. So, the short answer is I, I have no idea, but some questions I have are actually about time scale. And, and one thing, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. One thing that strikes me as potentially very different about social media as compared with previous technological developments, which each brought with, with them their own moral panic about, oh, you know, now that we have radio, you know, everything is going to be different. Now that we have television, everything is going to be different, right? I mean, you know, historians of, of technology have pointed out multiple times that, you know, all of this concern we have about social media changing and the internet changing us dramatically is, is not a new thing that, that this, this idea has been raised every time there's a new technology. So then what is different, if anything, about social media? Um, and one thought is just the this, this speed at which ideas and information can travel around the globe in a way that is, is much more organic than it used to be before. And, you know, what we work on in my lab is, is this spread of, of moral information, um, which you could argue is the most, the most engaging kind of information and, um, a postdoc in my lab, uh, Billy Brady, before he came to work with us uh, in his dissertation, showed that tweets that express moral emotions, words like hate, destroy, terrible, etc., um, they are more likely to go viral. And many other studies have, have showed that, you know, moral information, particularly when it drives our emotions, is, is extremely engaging. And so I wonder about the long-term consequences of the ability for anyone to spread moral information, moral narratives, just so rapidly and so far around the globe and the role of social media in this. And 
the biggest question for me is, you know, how do we separate the, the clear advantages from being able to call out injustice, even if you're not very powerful yourself, organize social movements for uh, fighting inequality and injustice on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know, those same algorithms are contributing to the spread of, you know, disinformation that is also, you know, attacking marginalized groups, you know, hate speech, harassment, the myth that the election was stolen, and so on. So, you what, know, you mean it wasn't stolen? <laughs> like, what? Oh, God. <laughs> I, I couldn't resist that. So, you know, it's it's really tricky because, you know, we, we work we work specifically on moral outrage. We've been developing methods for measuring moral outrage expressions on social media at scale. And a question that I get asked a lot is, oh, so would, should we just like turn down moral outrage then? Should we eliminate it from the news feeds? And, and the answer is clearly no to that question. You know, in some moral outrage is necessary and very productive, um, but there are also some negative consequences, particularly when the outrage is being used in, in the service of, say, white supremacy or <laughs> false concerns about a you know, the safety of vaccines or, you know, there are many examples. Yeah. Right. In fact, you know, you've, I, I recall you've talked about costs and benefits of moral outrage as having changed. So just say a little bit more about that. I think it's important when thinking about the question of costs and benefits to clearly separate the descriptive questions. So, you know, how are humans in the wild, so, you know, what describes human behavior on the one hand, and, and normative questions, the sort of what ought we to do, what should happen, right? And science is really well equip equipped to answer the descriptive questions, um, while the normative questions are really questions of ethics and, you know, the, the, the field of uh, applied ethics and tech ethics, I think, has a really important task to articulate principles, you know, different approaches for handling these questions about how should we design technology to achieve, you know, collective goals or particular outcomes in society, you know. And I'm, I'm not a philosopher, although I collaborate with philosophers all the time. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel less qualified to answer those questions. But in terms of individual costs and benefits of, of expressing outrage, so, you know, before, before social media, if you wanted to punish someone who you perceived violated a social norm, did something unjust, it's, it's costly in several ways, right? If it's someone who's already violated a norm, then there's a big risk that they might retaliate against you physically or in other ways. It's, it's stressful and awkward to confront somebody. Um, you know, I think we are sort of naturally equipped to you know, shy away from conflicts. There's, a, there's a, a, a clip from the Jimmy Kimmel show that I just love about a New York Yankees baseball player, I believe, who had deserted the team to go play for another team. And he was coming back to Yankee Stadium for a game where he was on the other team. And they went out um, onto the streets of New York with a, a big cutout of, of this player. I think it was Robinson Cano. And um, they invited passersby to boo the cardboard cutout of the player and this is all on film and so you know all these people are going up to like boo you know screw you you know how could you leave us and then unbeknownst to them the actual guy is hiding behind the cutout and and so after they've booed him extensively the guy steps out and you can see on the film these reactions of these people and they immediately just transform into polite, respectful, like, oh, hey, you know, oh, it's so nice to meet you. You know, it's just such a powerful demonstration. I play this for my students when I, when I teach this in um, my social neuroscience class, just how like face-to-face -face interactions have a quality. They, they activate all of these, you know, automatic processes that evolved to, to smooth our interactions. 
that just don't get activated when you're not interacting with somebody face to face. And so what this means is that it's less costly in this personal sense to express outrage or, or punish someone um, in an online context. Again, you know, the normative question of whether this is a good thing or a bad thing is, you know, really depends, right? Like if if the shaming that that you wouldn't otherwise do because you're someone who is marginalized and you know faces real risks to your body, your well-being, your livelihood for speaking out, you know, there's safety in the anonymity and the numbers of calling out injustice online. But that same safety also makes it easier for people who want to harass or uh, bully others uh, from doing that too, right? So again, it's a two-edged sword. This reminds me of something that came up when I read some of your work, and that is, is it possible that people actually aren't as pissed off or angry in reality as they appear to be online because of this reason? Like, you know, do I mean, are people really as angry as they are? Or is this just like, yeah, I'm just going to express anger and, and, you know, go grab a beer and see what's what happens in the meantime? Could that be going on? And we're just sort of making a huge deal out of this. We're just amplifying this uh, anger needlessly. This is one of the questions that we are actively working on in my lab right now. The hypothesis is that because there is, you know, not always, but but often a sort of a, a conformity effect in online social networks. And in your episode with Sinan, you talked about how social media alg algorithms really create these dense clusters of social networks, right? Homophily is, is a really um, powerful phenomenon. And so there's, there's now several groups, including our group, who have evidence for conformity in online expression in terms of emotions and in terms of the topics that people talk about. And so a potential consequence. So how, how do you study that in the lab, you know, have that sort of validity that it, this is what's happening in the real world? I'm just curious. Well, these are studies that we've done in the real world. So with, yeah, okay. so, so looking at, at data from, from Twitter users. And, um, and so we can, we can see evidence for people matching their expressions for, um, you know, emotional content and, you know, others have seen matching of political ideology online. So one potential consequence of this that you raise is that the signals that we're seeing online are not necessarily reflecting what people actually feel. And so this could create a situation where it looks like everyone is outraged, but the actual emotions that users are experiencing are less intense than they are perceived to be by others. And if this is happening, then this is, this is troubling because it creates a, a situation that's sometimes called pluralistic ignorance or uh, false polarization or preference falsification. It goes by sort of different names. But how are we supposed to coordinate our social and political behavior if we don't actually know what others in our group or indeed in opposing groups actually feel. And this gets compounded because I think there is a tendency for each side of the political divide to caricature the other side. And, you know, this certainly happens if you look, if, if you dare to watch Fox News and look at the tweets and video clips that they are showing their viewers as representative of the liberal point of view. It's, it's not representative. How are we supposed to operate in a democracy if we don't know what other citizens believe and feel? So if I put these things together, it could be the case that, you know, social media platforms are by design or otherwise sort of designed to be addictive you know, that's a strong word, but, you know, keep people engaged, uh, you know, and inflame passions, polarize. And that seems to be working for them. But in fact, people may not be as pissed off as we, we believe they are. So it's almost like 
everyone's happy? I wouldn't say that because the other dimension that's really important to consider here is power. And one of the few positives of social media that many others have, have written about is to the extent that it does democratize information sharing. And I mean, that's a whole separate question about who has access and whose voices get amplified and who is even allowed to participate in uh, conversations in the, in the public sphere. The question is whose voices are being amplified by the algorithms? What do most users see in their own feeds? How representative are those, those voices of the general population? And my big takeaway from doing this research is that I feel like I just have less of a grip on what the temperature in the room actually is, because I know that my own personal news feed is a combination of people who I chose to follow and so have sort of personally curated and information within that set and adjacent to it that the algorithms think I will find engaging. And that's going to be really different from other people. And that's the point, right? It's personalized. So I don't know. But I mean, if you just look at the dramatic injustice in this country and of course around the world more broadly, like it can't be the case that everyone just feels fine. I mean, you know, pick your issue, but I mean, you know, the police, the pandemic, you know, people are not okay. But at the same time, there's probably some voices whose outrage is rewarded and amplified and other voices who can't even participate in the public conversation because they're still threatened by harassment and hate speech when they do participate online. And it's well documented that women and people of color are punished for expressing outrage, both in offline settings and increasingly in online settings. And so the picture of public sentiment that we get when we log on is not representative. Let me uh, pick up on something I actually asked Sina. And actually, you know, I started my conversation with this, and I'm curious to get your take on it. I mean, so my first question to him was like, are we actually being manipulated by algorithms? Like, what's your take on that? Absolutely. Of course. I mean, the fact that we are spending time on uh, using products that differentially reward us for different behaviors is manipulation. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I don't know how aware people are of that, but it's, you know, there's a whole literature in moral psychology um, on what's called the, the moral self. And the basic idea, which will, you know, it, it's quite intuitive, is that we all believe that our morality is really fundamental to our sense of self and who we are, right? So like Nina Strominger, who's at Wharton and colleagues have done studies where you ask participants, somebody through a, a brain injury loses their memories. Uh, how much are they the same person that they were before? They lose their, you know, sense of, sense of smell. How much are they the same person as they were before? How, if they, lose their sense of what's right and what's wrong. How much of the same person are they to who they were before? And what these studies show is that if people's morality changes, there's a perceived loss of identity. So our sense of who someone is is really, really tied up to what they believe is, is right or wrong. So when you juxtapose those findings, and again, they're quite intuitive, I think, against the knowledge that our moral expressions are subject to reinforcement processes, rewards that are delivered to us on social media through algorithms that are control controlled by these, you know, giant tech, tech companies. It makes me worried, you know, like how do we feel 
as a society about our expressions of morality, which are core to who we are as individuals, are being shaped over time by the interactions we have on social media, which are controlled by the algorithms. So is this fundamentally a business model problem? So if the business model were different, right? If, you know, let's say Facebook had a completely different model where it paid its users for being, you know, good participants or for, you know, rewarded them for buying something by giving them a rebate, right? And and they were like, you know, socially benevolent platform uh, somehow. I mean, it's sort of a little hard to imagine. Uh, you know, I, I guess the world would be a better place. Is, is So is this fundamentally, a you know, is this being driven by sort of a problem in this in the business model or you know to what extent is it us right to to what extent are we contributing as humans to the problem as sort of willing consumers of of social media and to what extent is it the business model what what's the source of this malevolent kind of manipulation that's going on it's a great question um and I, I it actually reminded me have have you seen the show the good place i have not oh it's it's great i recommend it there's a scene in this show where the the characters are discussing how, how to get into heaven I, it's, it's a it's it's a sort of allegory of of you know how good or bad behaviors uh, can let you get in the afterlife to the good place or the bad place it's a great show. Anyway, the the scene I'm thinking of is one where they're they're discussing whether or not it's morally good to send flowers to your elderly mother. And on the surface, it seems like, oh, obviously morally good. But you bought the flowers from a florist that uses pesticides that harm uh, an endangered species and it's uh a business that has exploitative labor practices. And so like the net impact of your action of sending the flowers to your mother is uh, is negative on overall well-being in the world. I, I totally got the details wrong on that. But the basic the basic idea is that like your example of of rewarding Facebook users for buying particular products is is, of course, itself like deeply morally fraught in, in many ways. Uh, I'm sure with with respect to the question of is it is it us or is it the platforms that's again really difficult to disentangle and I'm reminded of a medium post that Nick Clegg who's a high level executive at Facebook published in recent weeks I don't know if you saw that it was it was basically a response to the question of whether whether Facebook or other social media platforms are responsible for, you know, the spread of disinformation and, and polarization and, and so on. And, and where do you say? Um, well, I'll give you one guess as to what he <laughs> believes. Um, the, what struck me about the article, and it's a long piece, but one of the main arguments that he makes is that it's human choices that determine what gets shown in the newsfeed. And so it was a way of portraying newsfeed as like, well, neutral. You, you, like you like you made it as uh -huh. the user. So, you know, it's not our fault. We're just giving you what you want. Yeah. The problem with that argument is that it mistakenly relies on a view of human decision making that is fully intentional and fully goal directed and fully self-aware. And we know from decades and decades of research in, in psychology and neuroscience that only a small fraction of our behaviors are intentional and goal-directed. The vast majority of our behaviors are, are habitual, automatic, reflexive, and you know the, the evidence is mounting that the way we use social media is not intentional and goal-directed, but rather, you know, very quickly over time, you know, is likely to to take on more mindless, habitual, automatic qualities. And so if you have been using Twitter for several years and you get a lot of reinforcement from your network for expressing a particular 
political view, then you get shown more items in your feed that express that same view and you retweet those and you follow accounts that also express those views and your news feed becomes more and more uh, resembling the extreme end of the political spectrum that you started on. Yeah, you, you know, you could say that the way you got there was through your own decisions, but it's a real stretch to argue that all of those little, little thumb movements are, you know, people sitting there and thinking like, I would very much like for my feed to ultimately <laughs> resemble <laughs> this. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the design of social media platforms needs to incorporate an accurate view of how human decision-making actually works and to give users control at really critical points. So when you sign up and create a new profile, maybe periodically checking in so that people can, in moments where they do you know, want to be intentional about social media use, can set the dials, so to speak, in a way that that will be more intentional. And I mean, I think that there is some movement towards this and that same post by, by Clegg does mention that Facebook is moving towards, you know, more dashboard style features so that users can, can have more control over what they see in their feed. So and I, I, I think that it's, it's moving in that direction. But at the end of the day, if you have a business model that's driven by engagement and grabbing eyeballs, you know, you're, you're inevitably going to have the spread of, you know, really intense, sensational content. And um, again, the solution is not to get rid of all of that content, because like, as much as my personal stress levels did not want to see what was happening on January 6th, like as a citizen, I was glad to be shown that in my newsfeed. So, you know, when there are events in the world that generate outrage, like, you know, we do need to to be able to see that and to to share those sentiments with each other. Um, but you know, the the broader question is like, how do you design platforms and how do you regulate them in ways that are balanced? Right. So this is sort of the sixty four dollar question these days, right? That that regulators are, are struggling with. That what do we do? And it's a really thorny kind of question. And I guess my approach has been sort of more normative in, in the sense that, you know, I'm calling for more transparency, right? So mm -hmm. I'm saying that, you know, it ain't right that we don't know what these algorithms do all day long, right? Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's not right that, um, you know, that regulators... You know, ideally, they you know they should have an API into you know, because this is for all practical purposes the public square, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, if if this is indeed a public good which we talk about, then there should be transparency. You know, mm -hmm. we should be able to go there and see, you know, what the algorithms are doing, what decisions they're making, uh, and, and so on, with the goal of actually having enough data down the line so that, you know, maybe there are enough sort of natural experiments that have been conducted by the platforms and maybe six months, a year, two years down the line, we can actually have the data to be able to study the impacts of algorithms in society. And then we mm -hmm. can start making sort of more informed decisions, right? Yeah. So, I, I guess, sorry, I've just said too much, but I'm just curious to get your take because, you know, you referred to sort of the normative and descriptive. And when I thought about it, I said, you know, you're right. You know, you're studying the world as it is and, you know, the impacts of A and B on people. And I guess, you know, I, I see myself as saying, yeah, you know, that's good, but let's also have some more transparency and more data that that can be studied scientifically Mm -hmm. to uh, you know to to give us better insights on you know what's really going on what's you know how these algorithms are impacting us like what what are your thoughts on this i 100% agree and you know whenever i get asked about you know you know what are your policy recommendations 
my initial thought is like, oh my God, we need more data. But then of course, you know, there's there's the the tension between, you know, do you act now based on what evidence we do have with the hope that you can prevent future harm or do you wait and and try to gather more evidence and i mean this is you know incidentally you know something that has been a huge question in the social sciences uh, well and the medical sciences with the pandemic right you know there's this 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 really really difficult trade-off between you know when do you have enough evidence to to make a policy recommendation so with respect to the algorithms yeah it, like one thing that I've seen happen a few times now is that there will be a very simple narrative explanation for, you know, something that the the algorithms are doing. So like after the 2016 election, it was like, oh, you know, fake news swayed the election, you know, fake news from the Ru Russians swayed the election. And, you know, the data that has come out since is more mixed. I mean, it is a really compelling narrative and it's it's compelling both because it's it's sensational and it 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 ticks all our you know it ticks all it pushes all our, our moral buttons, right? There's a clear villain or something that's like clearly bad and you know there's also it suggests a clear solution like oh if we could only solve the fake news problem then our democracy will be fine. But you know, clearly the the problems are are more complex than that. And, you know, some of the, the work that's since come out on fake news and social media shows that, you know, it's a very small percentage of content that's that's shared, the, the news that's actually fake. If you exp expand the umbrella to include, um, you know, sort of misleading partisan content, then then that starts to become a more compelling story. But the other side of it is, well, so there, there are two further challenges with just doing the research to generate the evidence that you would ideally want to have to make good policy decisions in this space. One, it's really freaking hard to get data access. So, you know, Twitter, as, as, as much as you could say about harmful effects of, of that platform, like they are very open with their data and you know it's it's quite easy for academics to access data uh, from twitter and so this is why you have so much more academic work published on on twitter data than any other platform because it's it's really accessible facebook data really difficult to to, to work with um and you know the few p papers that have been published have always been published with i don't know if always but but the majority are, are published um, with internal people who work at Facebook, so collaborative studies. And, you know, that's not to say they're not valid, but there are clear questions of conflict of, of interest there. Um, we've been part of the Social Science One effort, which was a, a new model that was tested for uh, researchers to get access to Facebook data, um, URLs that were shared um, between uh, yeah, in the past several years, massive data set, just, you know, really, really Im impressively large data set that we had access to. But um, it, it was a, a challenge. It was a project that had a lot of challenges because um, Facebook's main interest, which, you know, I don't begrudge them, is to keep, uh, is to prioritize the, pri the privacy of users. Um, but what that means is that as researchers, we could only work with data that was um, differentially private, which are, are you familiar with? Yes. With, uh -huh. Yeah. yeah but but yeah. explain it. Explain it for the listeners. Yeah. 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 Oh, dear. Okay. Um, <laughs> so so it, it's, it's basically a procedure that adds noise to data, which makes individual users not identifiable from data sets. But it, it adds a layer of complication to running even basic statistical analyses and required a whole you know, new way of doing science and new software environments to be uh, to be created, and so the the project was uh, was plagued by a lot of delays, and a, a lot of the analysis that we wanted to do and what we wrote in our grant proposal was simply not possible because the technology didn't exist to, for example, upload models that we had built in other environments into the environment where the data was held, and so um, you know. I, I hope that, that this kind of 
endeavor can can proceed in the future, but uh, there are lots of barriers to accessing Facebook data. And this just makes it hard to do research. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the difference between Twitter and Facebook in terms of access to data for scientific purposes, because I mean, that says a lot, and maybe that's uh, uh, an interesting data point in itself that's worth considering as, as we think about, you know, moving towards more transparency. You know, I want to come to something that, you know, I've written about and I see you have as well, and that is this notion of trust. And, you know, and, and you know, one of my core questions is, you know, when, when do we trust machines with decision making? And, you know, you've done, you know, plenty of experiments on this that I, you know, want to hear about. In, in preparation for our chat, I was reading this paper by Peter Railton, who's a moral philosopher at the University of Michigan. And he's done lots of experiments on the trolley problem. You know, to summarize it really quickly for the listeners, you know, there's a train speeding down the tracks and, you know, there's five workers that are going to get killed. But if you pull a lever, the train will go off and kill one person. Should you pull the lever? Most people say yes. Uh, and the next variant is, you know, there's a footbridge and there's a fat man standing there. And if you push, sorry, large man, and if you push him, the... You'll save five people, and people say no. They, you know, you shouldn't push this person. And so, variants of this problem that reveal some real subtleties in how people make moral judgments. So, say something about your work in that context, and uh, and how it impacts, uh, you know, how we trust people or how we trust machines. Yes, exactly. So, so the trolley problem highlights a tension between two ethical traditions. On the one hand, you have consequentialist theories that say uh, you ought to maximize the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And so those theories say that you should, you should flip the switch or you should push the, the person in front of the trolley because one life will be lost, but five will be saved, and five is greater than one. Therefore, you know, overall, you, you should sacrifice the one to save the many. Whereas deontological theories uh, say that there are some actions that are just wrong, regardless of whether they have good consequences or not. So those theories say you, you actually shouldn't use one person as a means to saving even many other people. Um, that violates, you know, right to autonomy and, and, and so on. What we have shown in a series of experiments is that in sacrificial dilemmas like the trolley problem, people are less willing to trust an agent who uh, is consequentialist, who says you should sacrifice the one to save the five. We've shown this across a number of, of different dilemmas. And the way this relates to algorithms and AI is that, you know, quite a lot of the philosophers working in, you know, ethical AI development are adopting a consequentialist view and just sort of take it as a given that AI should be programmed in a consequentialist way. So take, for example, a self-driving car that if faced with a decision between, you know, continuing on a current course and, you know, running over three pedestrians or swerving and hitting one pedestrian, that the car should be programmed to do this. That would be a consequentialist uh, AI. Some work from Azim Sharif, Ayad, Rowan, um, and colleagues have looked at preferences for self-driving cars, whether people would want to buy an autonomous vehicle that prioritizes the driver's life over others, even if that means killing more people, or a, a consequentialist autonomous vehicle, which might sacrifice the life of a driver if it would mean saving more lives. And what's interesting is that they find people in general prefer consequentialist vehicles to be on the road, but they want their car to be deontological, to prioritize them. And I just love that finding because it fits so well with our findings on trust, right? Like, you you know, our sense of trust is an evolved sense, right? It, it evolved to serve 
our social relationships. And it totally makes sense that you would want to be in a relationship someone who, with someone who's really predictable, who's you know, going to prioritize you and your relationship, even if, even if it means you know, that the consequences for others m- might be worse. And so we have now a lot of data from various types of experiments that, you know, trust is really sensitive to features of whether someone will will prioritize you over others and and consequentialists, uh, for better or for worse, suffer a cost there. You know, following up on that, you know, I was thinking about this, you know, the the self-driving car case is sort of an obvious moral dilemma, Mm -hmm. but... It seems to me that sometimes morality is kind of in the eye of the beholder. You know, and, and the example that, that comes mm-hmm. to mind is, you know, let's say a woman's giving birth and, and the doctor has to make a decision that he can sacrifice the fetus to save the mother. Let's say that that's kind of the, the dilemma. And, you know, as a consequentialist, that's what he or she would do. You know, whereas let's say there was, you know, Dr. B and Dr. B's sort of morals are that you never harm a fetus. I'm just making this up. Mm -hmm. And so it turns into a moral problem, whereas for the physician A, it was a cost-benefit analysis, uh, a professional decision, but, you know, involving risks and benefits as it should have been. Uh, whereas for the latter, it's it, you know the the framing is different, and so it mm-hmm. becomes a a moral sort of problem. Is that the case sometimes, where you know morality is just sort of in the eye of the beholder? Yes, absolutely. And I think this is this is going to be a real challenge for the development of trustworthy AI as algorithms become increasingly involved in all kinds of decisions with moral implications. So, I mean, self-driving cars is the sort of like most popular example, but AI is involved in parole decisions and decisions about Mm -hmm. who gets insurance, welfare, um, who gets into university. You know, there are lots of cases now um, and and the AI is, is just increasingly involved in these kinds of decisions that people around the world have strong moral intuitions about. And because we know that the way an agent approaches a moral decision impacts how much they're trusted, there's a worry that there might be a disconnect between the engineers designing the AI who, you know, we know that the field of AI is extremely homogenous, you know, it's mostly men, mostly white people, mostly in, you know, a handful of countries, right? If those folks are designing artificially intelligent systems with a particular ethical approach that seems just totally, you know, like a no-brainer to them and fail to recognize that actually for other people who might be users of this technology, it's not at all intuitive and in fact counterintuitive or morally abhorrent, then you're going to have a problem with the widespread adoption of these technologies because if people don't trust them, they're not going to use them. And so, you know, I think this this just speaks to yet another reason why it's important to have diversity in the the research and, and the design of these new technologies because the more people you have in the room who can relate to these different ways of thinking about morality, the, the less likely that viewpoints will be overlooked with, you know, potentially harmful consequences. Yeah, that's, you know, really interesting. In fact, I, I, you know, I I read one of your articles about this, you know, where you say that it's, it may not be enough for us that machines make the right judgments, even the ideal judgments. And I'm I'm actually quoting you. Mm. You said we want those judgments to be made as a result of the same psychological processes that cause us to make them, namely the emotional reactions and intuitive responses that have evolved us to uh, to make us distinctly moral creatures. And so, you know, I, I, I read that and I was thinking about it. And I said, that's interesting because, you know, we know that machines see the world differently than humans do. Like, And, and by see, I mean, like, literally, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, whether looking at medical images or, or the world around us. So, so we know that their quote-unquote psychological processes will be different from ours, right? But 
you know, one of the things that also struck me in that article is that you said that it's not all bad for the consequentialists, right? That is, those consequentialists who are who struggle or express mm-hmm. doubt or or something deeper are trusted more, right? Mm-hmm. And so it made me wonder whether that's sort of the next step for AI, right? Because mm-hmm. at the because at the moment we're sort of, you know pretty much fixated on prediction and decision making and and the right kinds of decisions you know and 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 some people make the case that you know machines need to be able to explain themselves and and all of that and i've often wondered whether that you know the the the, uh, the you know whether explanation is overvalued and and certainly people in perception would argue that it is right so when i was talking to jan lekun you know, he said, you know, I don't believe you need to explain why you why you think a tree is a tree, or you know, so so I can imagine that in, you know, problems of perception like vision and language, you know, it's good enough to be really accurate, mm-hmm. you know, and 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 so humans yeah. will trust the machine because it's accurate; it doesn't need to explain itself. But there is this whole other class of problems of decision making that aren't quite as, you know clear cut we you know where ground truth quite you know isn't quite as clear cut you know parole decisions yep. you know medical decision yep. making all of these kinds of uh, kinds of decisions mm-hmm. where I, I guess the next step would be to have the machine say you know like i'm struggling with this one yep. <laughs> you yep. know but <laughs> but here's the case for decision a and here's the case for decision mm-hmm. b and you know i really think that you know, decision yeah. A is the right one, right? It seems to me that maybe that's kind of the next step in the evolution of AI, especially for those kinds of problems. Absolutely, you're spot on. And, and in fact, one of the studies that we're working on in my lab with my um, PhD student, Anne-Marie Nussberger, is looking at which types of AI applications people demand explanations for. So the intuition is exactly what what you said for certain types of applications like you know, vision or like, you know, sorting photographs or, you know, making shopping recommendations. Like people don't really care about understanding how the AI arrived at its decision. But our prediction is that for more impactful and and more morally fraught or relevant decisions, like parole decisions or medical decisions, people very much want AI to be interpretable and explainable. And, you know, this, this raises a really interesting conundrum because, you know, what we found in our own work using machine, different types of machine learning classifiers that are more or less opaque to categorize outrage on social media, oftentimes the algorithms that make the most accurate predictions are black box. They're less interpretable, um, even by, even by the engineers. And so what does that mean then if you have two possible algorithms, one that is more accurate in classification, but less explainable, and another one that is less accurate and more explainable, but the fact that it's more explainable means it will be trusted more by users. How do you decide which one to use? That's a really interesting question, right? And and one that I think um, we're, we're hoping to have more data soon to address. Yeah, in fact, you know, it, it maybe maybe that points to our own limitations as humans, right? So that maybe it's not the machines that are the problem uh, completely, but maybe it's our own limitations uh, mm-hmm. as, as humans that sort of we seek these simple explanations that we can understand, and and sometimes they may not be the best for us, right? So even if you get that warm fuzzy feeling that yeah, I I, I trust this because I understand it, mm-hmm. maybe that's not the best decision, right? So that yeah. maybe. That's a limitation of ourselves exactly. that, that we're looking at. Exactly, and I think touches on many of the topics we discussed. Cool, Molly. That's uh, fascinating. I, you know, I'm really glad we had this conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your time with you know the people who tune in from all over the world to listen to this podcast. So thanks again. It's been delightful talking to you. Absolutely, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. 